Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining in the message today. Our prayer is that it would strengthen you and encourage you in your faith. And if it does that, please consider sharing this content so we can continue to spread the good news into our communities, to our friends, and our families, and all around the world for Jesus. And if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, then please introduce yourself via our website, which is victorymj.com, or send us an email at connect at victorymj.com. We can also have the conversation on social media. Just look for Victory Church MJ, and you'll find us on all the social platforms. Thanks again for joining us. Blessings. Now let's head into the message. So there is a battle going on, a war raging, and sometimes when we hear things like that, we think, oh, that's out there somewhere, right? That's that's some problem out in some place. But the truth is, the battle that is being waged, the spiritual war that's happening, is on our doorsteps. It's in our homes, and it's for our homes and for our hearts. And of course, the Bible says that we have an enemy. He's a thief. He's a a, a liar. He wants to destroy us. And the question that I want us to ask today is, am I dressed for battle? Are you dressed for the battle? Because the Bible never gives us a time in life when it's okay to not be dressed for the battle that we all face in our lives. Uh, So we've been learning in this series, Victory at Home, that if we're going to have victory at home, we're going to have to be intentional. We're not going to be able to just, it's not going to happen all by itself. And we're actually going to have to fight for it. Adam and Eve were placed in a home in the Garden of Eden, and they were told they needed to tend and watch over that. And of course, uh, when the enemy came, they didn't do a very good job of protecting. And because of that, chaos ensued. And I just believe so many times in our lives, we needlessly end up in chaos and darkness and despair and discouragement and and frustration and even hopelessness. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, You can fight back. You can fight the enemy in your life. And here's the deal. I can't do it for you. As your pastor, I wish I could fight your battles for you. But the truth is you have a stewardship over your own heart, over your own home, and you have responsibility there. And so what we're trying to do in this series is offer you vision and say, you know, God has a way, right? God has something better for us, the kingdom of God, the will of God that you can invite into your life and home and and to see your home as a place of replenishing and purpose and growth and connection and and, and a life-giving place. Get that vision. And we can offer you a sense of hope right? We can offer each other that hope that our God is bigger and there is no problem that we face that God cannot overcome. I love it when you read the Gospels, you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see these people encountering Jesus whose lives look hopeless, who are bound in darkness, and yet they encounter Christ and they're changed. And it just gives me hope. It gives me hope for myself. It gives me hope for every person I encounter. And of course, we can also offer each other equipping that uh, God does have a battle plan, and we can see that in his word. So we've been looking at Ephesians 6, this great spiritual warfare, classic spiritual warfare passage. And uh, last week we focused on the first three verses. I'll read those to you. It says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Because we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Man, that has helped me so many times where I've had conflict in my life and challenges in my life. And, and somehow, I, I, sometimes through prayer, sometimes just through becoming aware, sometimes through a conversation, but some, when I realize, oh my goodness, there's a spiritual battle going on here. It's, it's not just what's happening on the outside. And against mighty powers in the dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. So, this is what we said last week. The first principle is to realize you are in a battle. One of the enemy's number one tactics is to keep us unaware, right? To keep us, to to, to be sneaking around, doing what he does, but not being alert to it. And of course, the way Peter describes that, he just says, stay alert, wake up, right? Keep an eye out, because you do have an enemy. Um, The second thing we learned is that we are to fully engage in this battle, right? Put on the full armor of God, that that our lives are at stake, our eternities are at stake, other people's lives and eternities are at stake. So take this battle seriously. Let's not compromise, even a little bit, right? I don't want a little bit of evil or a little bit of sin or a little bit of poison in my home or in my life. 
Um, actually, one of the guiding verses for me when I was a young man came out of Romans chapter 12. And you know what it says? It says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Man, that verse has been so helpful to me over the years. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. In other words, it's not just like, yeah, whatever, we'll do our best, we'll see how it goes. It's a, it's a man, we have got to be fully engaged in the battle against evil. And then the third principle we learned last week was to be confident in God's power. There is never a time you need to fear the enemy. Be why? Because God has overcome. And Jesus has actually given you and I power. It says in Luke 10, 19, Jesus speaking to his disciples, Behold, or take a look, I have given you power over all the power of the enemy. Jesus has all authority. How many of you know when it comes to Jesus fighting the devil, there's no power struggle there, right? That's like trying to fight an ant. I mean, the, 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 the enemy is a defeated foe, and what God wants for us is to know the power that's available to us. I love that prayer in Ephesians 1. I pray that you would know the resurrection power of God is available to you. So you don't need to be afraid. You need to be confident in the power of God. Or the way James says it, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Not he might flee. Not if, you know, if you've prayed enough that week or this or that. He will flee. And in Colossians 2.15, Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities and shamed them publicly by his victory over them or triumph over them on the cross. He's a defeated enemy. And that is why, and this is what's going to lead us into everything we're going to talk about today. That is why spiritual warfare is not primarily a power struggle. Okay? It's a truth struggle. People are in bondage. Christians are in bondage to the enemy, not because of his power over us, but because of his lies that we believe. Spiritual warfare is a truth struggle, and that's where we're, what we're going to get into today. And that's really the fourth principle that the rest of this passage takes into consideration. And, and I put it this way. Fill your home with God's truth. Fill your home with God's truth. If you want to win the spiritual war over your home, over your life, fill your home with the truth of God. And you say, well, how do I do that? Well, in this passage, you make sure you're always dressed for battle. So here's how it reads. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And after the battle, you'll be standing firm. So stand your ground, putting on, and then he's going to name all these pieces of spiritual armor. The belt of truth is the first one, right? The first piece of armor you're going to need if you're going to fight a spiritual battle, the belt of truth. And of course, a belt holds everything else together. And the truth is actually what every single piece of armor has to do with. So all the rest of these pieces of armor are all going to be aspects of God's truth that holds all of our armor really together. The second one, and the body armor of God's righteousness. So God, uh, when we give our hearts to Christ, God puts his righteousness upon our lives. He exchanges our righteousness for his own, which is a, a wonderful reality. And actually in uh, scripture, the enemy, the devil, is the accuser, right? So he comes to us and condemns us, tries to fill us with shame. And the way we get to respond as followers of Jesus is I am covered in the righteousness of Christ. That it's not my righteousness that makes me right before God. It's Jesus' righteousness. It's Jesus who came and died on the cross for my sins and exchanged my right, my sin, really, for his righteousness. And so I don't stand before God, uh, right before God or holy before God because I'm such a good person, but because Jesus is such a good person. He's lived the perfect life. And he exchanged that for mine. And, and actually, I love the, the picture of Roman body armor because if you ever look at the Roman body armor, it already has the muscles built in. You ever notice that? It's got these awesome pecs and awesome abs, and it's like, Wah, right? It's got this perfect muscles right there. And of course, underneath that armor, probably ain't so perfect, right? But you've got that perfection there. And, and I think that's just such a great symbol that we get to exchange. I love the way Pastor J.D. Greer puts it. He says, I get to give up the love handles of my sin for the perfect abs of Jesus' righteousness, right? 
And, and that's really the righteousness of God that he puts on us. And, and we remind ourselves day by day. One of the most common reminders through the New Testament written to the church is you're forgiven in Christ. You've been saved in Christ. You've been made righteous in Christ. And, and so we hold on to that as part of the defense against the enemy in our lives. Then the next one, for shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. What's the good news? Well, it's the message of God's truth for the world. Right? It's the good news that, that I carry with me, that you carry with you everywhere we go. Our feet are, are ready to be able to declare the truth of God, that though we don't deserve it, God loves us, he redeems us, he welcomes us into his family, that, that without Jesus, we're weak and sinful and in darkness, but with Jesus, we find strength, we come alive, we're transformed. And you know what? That's how we overcome the enemy, with that gospel reality, that I'm not looking to myself, that I'm not leaning on myself, that I'm looking to God, that it's not by my might or my power, but it's by God's spirit, it's by God's strength, it's by what Jesus has done on my behalf in the cross and the resurrection. That's the gospel reality that we carry with us everywhere we go every day. In addition to all of these, Hold up the shield of faith that stops the fiery arrows of the devil. So what's faith? Faith is looking away from myself and looking to God, saying, God, I'm trusting you. I'm trusting your word. I'm trusting your promises. God, I'm going to hold to your truth, even above whatever appears to be right or true. I'm going to believe you. And put on the salvation as your helmet. Um, again, God's salvation is something that he gives us and it protects us um, every believer that i have talked to about spiritual warfare has had times in their lives where the enemy sowed lies into them to make them question their own salvation and to make them kind of go wow maybe i'm not a christian maybe i'm not saved. maybe god didn't save me and these these thoughts come and bombard us and again what what's that reminder over and over again through the the letters that Paul writes, he reminds them of the wonderful salvation that they have in Christ. Not based on themselves, but based on Jesus and what he's done. And so we hold on to that assurance of our salvation as a protection over our lives. And we say, you know, devil, you cannot lie to me about my salvation because Jesus has done it. And it's not based on me. It's based on him. I'm saved by his blood and I'm kept in Christ. And then take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And this is the only offensive weapon, right? All the rest are defensive, but then we're given this offensive piece. And this is just the truth brought to offense, right? The Word of God, which we get to take on the offensive, praying in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. And so, of course, now that we're dressed for battle, what do we have to do? We have to head into battle, right? So we head into prayer praying, using the truth of God in the spiritual realm, and then, of course, bringing that truth into the natural realm, staying alert and being persistent in our prayers for all believers everywhere. What a cool passage, right? And you see the emphasis over and over again through all of that being dressed for battle is that we would be filled with and covered with and able to engage with, use God's truth in our lives. Lives. And why is it that truth becomes this repetitive piece when it comes to spiritual warfare? Well, it's because the enemy's only power over you and me is to deceive us, right? Because he has no, no uh, authority over us, but if he can cause us to believe lies, then he can hold us in bondage. Um, it's actually one of the ways that they train elephants is when they're little baby elephants, they'll tie tie them to their, their leg to a, a post or a tree or a stump. And then uh, when that elephant tries to move around, he finds out as far as the rope can go is as far as that elephant can move. But as the elephant gets bigger and bigger and bigger, of course, they're massive, strong animal. They, at some point, they could easily pull that that stake out of the ground, pull that stump over or, or break the, the, the rope. I mean, with, with hardly a movement. But they actually won't. They won't ever even test it. In fact, I was just talking to Pastor Chris between the services and he said, yeah, a lot of times they'll even tie an elephant to a plastic chair. 
<laughs> they just put a little plastic chair out, tie a little rope, and they'll put the elephant there, and the elephant will never go beyond the, the, the length of that rope. See, the enemy can keep us bound if he can keep us believing lies. In fact, Jesus said this in John chapter 8. He's, he's, he's rebuking the religious leaders, and he says, You are of your father, you're children of your father, the devil. You love to do the evil things he does. He's a murderer from the beginning. He's always, look at this, hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character. He's a liar and the father of lies. He's a father of lies. That's, that's his strategy. That's what he did with Eve in the garden. Or that he's like, did God really say that? It brings question to God's word. He says, ah, it's not true. You won't really die. Money, if God just doesn't want you to be like him, he doesn't want you to know this, he sows these seeds, sows these lies into her mind, into her heart. And Jesus says that, you know, the way that you can discover freedom then from the enemy is to replace those lies with the truth. And this is actually just a few verses earlier in John chapter 8. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, my word. Remember that? The, the sword of the spirit is the word of God to fight the enemy. You are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How are you going to find freedom? Well, you're going to lay hold of God's word and you're going to fight with that sword of the spirit. Actually, when our church had our 25th anniversary, it's pretty cool, eh? We had our 25th anniversary as a church. Uh, I was given this Dr. George and Hazel Hill. They were the founders of Victory Churches. They brought this and said, here, you get a sword for leading your church through those 25 years. I was like, hey, that's pretty cool. That's kind of fun. So, Hopefully that'll be a little reminder to you. And of course, the reason they brought that sword is to, to symbolize this very reality. Uh, actually, Jesus, in uh, Matthew chapter 4, uh, Jesus is uh, baptized and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the Bible says he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Which is interesting all on its own because I think sometimes we think if I'm spiritual... You know, if I'm really following Jesus, if I'm really following the Holy Spirit, then I won't have any spiritual attacks in my life, right? I won't have any problems. I won't have any temptations. How many of you know that's just not true? That actually many times when you follow the Holy Spirit, you'll experience more challenges, not less. Sometimes more spiritual attacks, sometimes more temptations. And Jesus, in, the, in, in Matthew 4, he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. And, and there in that confrontation with the devil, Jesus takes out his spiritual sword, right? He brings a word of God to every one of those three temptations. This is the first one here in Matthew 4.4. 4. He answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And what I love there is he just goes, it is written. It is written. It is written. And because he knows the truth of God, he's able to defeat the lies of the enemy. Uh, interesting passage in 2 Corinthians 10 that describes spiritual warfare. It says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Which is, sounds pretty fantastic, right? I mean, we're demolishing strongholds. Raw, right? In the spiritual realm. That's pretty cool. But look what it says in the next verse. It describes what those strongholds are. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You see that? So the strongholds that you and I are called to demolish that the enemy sets up in our lives, they're not sort of a spiritual castle in the sky. The strongholds that the enemy sets up are, are thoughts. They're ways of thinking. They're lies that bind us up. So you say, well, what, what kind of lie would bind a person up? Well, believing something that's not true about yourself, about God, about the way life works. Um, if, if, if you believe that you know, you need money to be happy. I just need more money, <laughs> right? And how many of you know, a lot of, lot of commercials on TV 
want you to believe that lie, right? And so, and of course, they don't come right at you. They're subtle and they sneak up on us. But if you believe that in your heart of hearts, you'll be bound by greed and bound by selfishness. And that becomes a stronghold of the enemy in your life. Uh, same oftentimes with fear, same oftentimes with just being in bondage to various sins in our lives. We just, we, we hold on to those things and they bind us up. And so it's, it's when, whenever we believe things that aren't true about ourselves, about God, about the way life works, that we end up bound up and we end up with strongholds. And in fact, sometimes we'll, uh, there's strongholds over a person. Sometimes there's strongholds over uh, a whole group of people. They begin to think the wrong way, believe the wrong things. Um, th things that aren't godly, things that aren't true about the way life works. And so sometimes when people are uh, talking about spiritual warfare over like a nation or over a city, they'll say, well, there's, there's a certain way of thinking that seems to have come over that city or over that area. And, and, and you know, we need to defeat that. We need to defeat the ways of darkness. But again, how do you defeat the darkness? Well, you have to come in with God's truth. Right? You have to replace the lies with the truth of God. Um, actually, that's really how all spiritual growth happens in our lives. In fact, you can trace your life. You can look at any area of your life where the darkness is winning and ask yourself this question, where is the lie that I'm believing? Where, where's the lie? Where's the, the thing that I'm holding on to that's, that's keeping me back? Uh, John 17, 17, Jesus says it this way, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So how are you going to change? How are you going to grow? How are you going to be sanctified? Well, you're going to get God's truth about that. Or Romans 12 too. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Be transformed how? By the renewing of your mind. I love the way James 1 puts this. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word of God. Humbly accept. Can we put that up on the uh, live stream as well so the Folks joining us online can see that. James 1.21. Therefore, get rid of all the moral filth and the evil. <laughs> guys on comms, you remind the guys in the back. All right. We're going to get rid of the evil that is prevalent in our lives. And, and how are we going to get rid of that evil? How are we going to take the evil out of our lives? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to bring God's word in. Right? So we're going to fill our hearts, fill our lives with God's word. And of course, that allows, that actually, let me say it to you this way. Another word for this, biblical word for this, is repentance. Repentance literally means to change the way I think. So when I repent, what I do is I, I take the wrong way of thinking and I replace it with the right way of thinking. And what, what is that? That's the process of sanctification. That's the process of spiritual warfare. That's the process of getting rid of the darkness and bringing in the light. That's the process God has us on. A couple more scriptures I'll, I'll show you on this. 1 John 2, 14. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong. And what? The word of God lives in you and you've overcome the evil one. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2, this is Paul telling Timothy how to lead well in the church. And he says, hey, some people are going to, you know, go, go sideways, go in the wrong direction, cause some trouble. He says, for those people, gently instruct them in the hope that God will grant them repentance, right? Leading them to a knowledge of the truth so that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who's taken them captive to do his will. So how, when, when somebody's been taken captive by the devil to do the devil's will, how do we as leaders help them find freedom? Well, we gently bring them the truth of God so that they can change the way they think, so we can replace those strongholds of the enemy, those ways of thought with God's word, with God's truth. So let, let me, I'll, I'll conclude with one more passage of Scripture um, that we'll look at together in Matthew chapter 12. But just before I get there, let me, let me just say this as we, we close the service today. My, my whole heart in this service is to just say to all of us, no matter what your age is, no matter uh, if you got little kids or big kids or kids moved out or no kids, take your home, and this is what I want to encourage us all to do, fill it with the word of God. 
Your ability to overcome the enemy is directly proportionate to your ability to bring the Word of God to bear in your daily life. Fill it with the Word of God. Fill your kids' hearts and minds with the Word of God. Your kids' ability to fight the enemy in their lives. To, you know, if, you, if your kids are battling peer pressure, bring them God's Word to bear on that. If your kids are battling anxiety and fear, discouragement, whatever it is, what does God have to say about those areas? And how can we replace what's not true with His truth? Matthew chapter 12, it's a fascinating passage of Scripture. Jesus talks about, again, defeating the enemy. He says this, When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert, seeking rest, but finding none. And it says, I will return to the person I came from. And it returns, and it finds the former home empty, swept, and in order. And the spirit finds seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. And I think this is such a great description, again, of spiritual warfare because, again, listen, it's, it's not so much a power struggle. You resist the enemy, he will flee. But if you want to stay free from the lies and the bondage of the enemy, the way to do that is to so fill up your heart, fill up your home with the presence, the word, the life, the, the pathways of God, that the enemy just has nothing to cling to there, nothing to stick to there, nothing to attract him there. <laughs> I always think of, uh, you know, a, a garbage in your house. You ever, anybody ever get those little, little fruit flies that hang around the garbage? You know those little tiny flies? And it's crazy, but if, if your garbage is open at all and there's any sort of sweets or anything like that in there, uh, it's amazing how those flies, and there'd just be one or two, and then suddenly there's 20 or 30, and then suddenly there's a whole ton of them. Now, how do you get rid of all those little guys? Well, you can run around and try to kill them all, right? And they're pretty easy to kill. I mean, there's not, not much... Trouble there, they're pretty easy to get rid of. You can get a fly swatter or you can just, you know. But you know the best way to get rid of them? Take the garbage out, right? Take what's attracting them there in the first place. Because even if you kill them all, what's going to happen tomorrow? There's just going to be more, right? There's just some other ones will find their way in and multiply. And that's exactly the way it is with the work of the enemy in our lives. And, and we're all going to find stuff like that in our lives. We're all going to have areas where we're like, Ugh, I'm not walking in victory. Uh, uh, my home's not walking in victory. But the key is we go find those areas. We say, what are the lies that, I've, that, that I've, I've been believing? Where is the enemy holding me in bondage in this area? And maybe it's with fears. Uh, maybe it's with distractions. Uh, maybe it's with behaviors, whatever it is. Where's the lie I'm believing? And how can I uh, dislodge that lie by bringing God's truth in and filling myself? And that's why we have to meditate on the truth of God, right? We have to bring it again and again and again and again. When Joshua was going into the promised land and he was going to possess the land, God said to him, he says, keep God's word in your mouth day and night, right? Just Keep it with you all the time. Be careful to live it all the time because it's out of God's word just being with you all the time that you'll make your way prosperous, that you'll have success, that you'll be taking this, this land that I have for you. So that's, that's my encouragement to us all. Just any way you can, by reading it, by listening to it, by memorizing it, by meditating on it, by uh, listening to sermons, by, just, by the right songs, the right music. Just say, God, I want my home filled with your truth. And the more you do that, the more alive and the more uh, you experience that, the, 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 the pathways of God. You know, in God's paths, there's life. Right? In God's paths, there's joy. In God's paths, there's peace. So we bring that truth to bear and we experience his kingdom. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, again, we, we need to build a kind of discernment over time. As we fall in love with God's word, as we, as Jesus said, abide in his word, we start to build up a kind of storehouse of discernment. So we can recognize those lies. Sometimes they're so subtle, right? 
I used to, when I was a youth pastor, I used to tell my, my youth, I said, uh, sometimes Disney movies are more dangerous than the R-rated ones. And my youth would look at me with big eyes, you know, what are you talking about, Disney? I'm like, yeah, because sometimes the lies are so subtle. You know, follow your heart. Don't follow your heart, follow Jesus, right? Your heart's going to lead you astray, man. It's crazy, right? Well, you be you. You just be you. Well, you be you in the image of Christ. All right, but be careful because you be you when you're feeling selfish, <laughs> right? And so on and so on and so on. I mean, we could go on and on, right? So, so we, we build this discernment over time and we go, okay, Lord, I'll increasingly uh, uh, push back the darkness and increasingly invite your light. And of course, that shines brighter and brighter every day. Let's, let's uh, take some time to pray. Again, if you want in person, would you just stand with me and uh, we'll pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the invitation to bring your word in prayer into every area of our lives to fight the good fight. And Lord, your word is, is really our equipping to live the life you've called us to live. And Father, forgive us for neglecting your word. One of the lies we've believed is that it's not important, that it's not life-giving, that it's not powerful. One of the lies we've believed is that there's other things more important for our success and for our prosperity and for us to live the lives that, that we want to live. And yet, God, the truth is, the truth is, in our heart of hearts, the best life we could live is the life you've called us to. And so God, help us to increasingly fill our homes, fill our hearts, fill our lives with your word. And Father, I do pray, as, as pastor in this church, I pray for every home and every heart connected to this church. I pray that the lies of the enemy would be silenced. I pray that the fear and the shame and the condemnation and just the deceptions of, in a hundred different directions of addictions and so on. Father, I pray against those right now in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that you would quiet the voice of the enemy over our lives. And Lord, we resist. We submit ourselves to you and we resist the enemy today. And Lord, I pray that he would flee. And Father, I ask that you would give us a hunger for your word, a desire for your truth, and, and that we would cling and hold to your promises. God, that increasingly our homes and our hearts and our minds and our mouths would be filled with the word of God. And we would increasingly experience it as it is life-giving. And that God, we would be able to shine that out from our lives to this broken world. You know, just one more thing I want to pray. Maybe you're joining this service again online or here in person. And you just say, you know, I'm not clear where I stand with God today. Um, the Bible offers this open invitation to what it calls salvation. And it just says, Jesus came so that anyone, anyone could receive him and become a child of God. You say, well, how does that work? Well, actually, how it works is that we come to God empty-handed. Instead of coming to God saying, look what I've done, we come to God saying, God, I'm broken. I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And Jesus came to be our Savior. He came to die on the cross for your sins and my sins, to pay the price so that you could know what it is to be forgiven. And he offers that to you out of grace as just a free gift. In fact, it's the only way to receive it is as a free gift. And so if you're not clear that you've ever received that, I want to encourage you just to do that today. And again, joining online or joining here in person, if you want to do that right now, I just invite you to lift up your hand and just say, yeah, that's me today. I want to receive Jesus into my life. So we're just going to say a prayer together. And if that's you, I want you to pray this prayer. Mean it with your heart. So Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner who needs a savior and I ask you to come into my life, forgive me of my sin, give me new life. You gave your life for me. I give my life to you. You promised me that if I'd receive 
Jesus, I'd become a child of God, so I do that right now. And I ask God that you would enfold me into your family and walk with me on the adventure of following you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You know, if you did that today, greatest decision you can make with your life, and we'd like to walk with you on that and just uh, help you along your faith journey. We've got materials we'd like to give you uh, with that, so you let us know with a communication card in the seat pockets or online, you let us know just by saying, I'm all in or I'm in, and uh, if you comment there or send us an email, uh, we'll get you some material to help you on your faith journey. But you guys are awesome. Um, online, I'm going to hand you off to Dave Beauclair. He's got some closing words for you. Hey everyone, thanks for joining on the message today. I hope you found it encouraging. And if today was your day, if you decided you're going all in for Jesus, if you became a Christian, then today is the best day of your life. So what's next? The next thing you need to do is tell somebody about it. So you can let us know by emailing us at connect at victorymj.com or fill out our connection card on our website, which is victorymj.com forward slash connect. Now, if you would be so bold as to partner with us, you could do that simply by liking and sharing this on social media or wherever you consume this content. The other way you can partner with us is financially. You can donate securely on our church app or on our website or even e-transfer at admin at victorymj.com. And if you do any of those things, we would really appreciate it because it helps us continue to make content just like this to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. So thanks again for joining us and I hope to see you all in the next one. God bless.